So it's been two years since I wrote my dissertation. However, I know everyone's been absolutely throthing out the mouth to hear what it said. So you're gonna have to suffer no longer because I present to you. Did Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis independently evolve creative desire? And was it in response to successive climatic changes as a secondary outcome of the neurological adaptations needed for survival? Now, because it's a bit of a longy, I'm probably going to do it in several bits because we've got many chapters to cover here and I'm going to do it in the order that it's been written. I just realised that I probably look really rough, so we're just going to have to ignore the situation at present. So let's first have a look as to why I actually did this particular topic. Basically, I love a bit of creativity. I, along with many other people, I'm sure, think it's something that makes humans stand out from the rest of biodiversity in general. Now, because many people believe that creativity is such an intrinsically important value to our own species, as some people may not like the idea, of Neanderthals having the same kind of abilities and innovative ideas that we do. I just thought it would be fun to start a few arguments, you know. So before we start talking about creativity, we need to have a definition. Now, from all the sources that I gathered together, I define creativity as any kind of medium, whether this be art, music, drama, pretty much anything that has been innovated imagined and originally produced by somebody. So we move on to the first chapter in this series. Very exciting stuff, I know. The evolution of the three major networks. So these three major networks comprise of emotional reactivity, self-control and self-awareness. Now, emotional reactivity is the oldest of these three, sitting at about 40 million years old. It basically allows us to create attachments social attachments while also learning behaviours. That works in tandem with self-control, which is about a two million year old network, which allows us to set goals, work in cooperation with others and make tools, which is very important. Now, the third network is the most important and obviously the youngest and the one that really makes us unique with having these three working together and that is self-awareness. Now that essentially promotes episodic learning, which basically means that we learn from our mistakes. Very simple, it is literally trial and error. As Dr. Robert Claude Clollinger put it, it is what enables us to have divergent original creative thinking and to be very flexible. Now, this network evolved at least 100,000 years ago at a time where there was about 200,000 homo sapiens roamed about. Now it's most likely quite a few thousand years older than that. However, this is where most of our artistic archeological evidence comes from. Now there was one very slightly biased study that was done on genes. I put it in the paper because I thought it was interesting. Wouldn't wholly rely on it though. Basically these scientists were saying that we have 972 genes that relate to our ability to be creative. And that from studying the Neanderthal genome, they only possess 267 of these genes. However, this seems like a little bit dubious. They were basically basing these off of the three major networks. So they were saying that Neanderthals appear to carry the same amount of genes for emotional reactivity as that of chimpanzees. However, their self-control and self-awareness was at an intermediate level between us and chimps. I would say this was a bit of an unfair study and I also think that Neanderthals must have had a good working social foundation within their brain and they must have also had the ability to produce some kind of rudimentary language. They had the vocal dexterity to make ooh, ee, ah sounds and they may have also used kind of clicking and stuff to create languages most likely localized to small groups and small areas however i highly doubt that they communicated in silence some researchers have said that divergent and convergent thinking are the two modes of thinking that have really propelled our species to become what it has so essentially divergent thinking is creative thinking it's trying to find solutions to problems in ways that aren't necessarily the most logical 
convergent thinking is logical thinking, very much left hemisphere kind of A to B straightforward thought processes. Now these two thought processes have most likely worked together to help us progress language, culture, innovation in general, inventions, advancements in technology, all of this. You'll actually find, obviously, there's a huge variation within our own species of how creative people can be. Some people very much left hemisphere, some people very much right. Those who are more creative tend to have a smaller number of a cluster of fibres called the corpus callosum, which essentially link the two parts of the brain together. Now those who have less fibres tend to develop each side of their brain more individually, and one normally becomes more dominant than the other. So if the right side of the brain has developed itself without having so much influence from the left, it's most likely that you're going to have a very creative individual that comes out of that. Now, if we look at brain physiology, you will find that scientists made what are called digital endocasts of Neanderthal and Homo sapien brains. They basically got the fossils of a Neanderthal cranium, digitalized it, and then tried to work out how big various regions of the brain were from these records. And of course, then did a comparison with the same digital model of our brains. So yes, Neanderthals have bigger brains on average than we do. However, a lot of it is gray matter that was largely used to control their much larger, much stockier muscles. And also is used to accommodate their large eyes, meaning that generally the occipital region of the brain took up a lot of space. However, within Homo sapiens, the cerebellum, the most important, I'd say, region to the sociality of our species is much larger than that of Neanderthals. The cerebellum is especially important for fine motor skills and high levels of cognition. Now this high level of cognition has massive implications for our sociality, ability to develop language, enhances our processing, learning, and social skills. So these are all kind of pretty key elements to what we would collectively call human intelligence. And that is the end of part one. Join me next time to take a look at the Stillbay complex and Howison's port.